Hi, this is Dr. Carl Goldcamp. A um, few things I have to say. One is we personally are involved both as a lifestyle, a ketogenic diet, but also through my 16 years of clinical practice of what is effective. What do people need to take sometimes, all the time, to support their ketogenic diet? You'll get bits and pieces of this ongoing week after week. It's important to be comprehensive. In one way, it's simple. and one way, it's a little bit complicated. Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Carl Goldcamp back for another episode of the Keto Naturopath. You know, um, the process we're in right now, which is following Brian's case from zero experience, in essence being a, a keto virgin to, we hope, in two months, a, a keto veteran and knowing what to do to monitor and take care of himself, is a fun process to participate in. It's a little bit like practicing medicine in the sense that you can't just talk about studies and data and everybody else's, you know, and, and, and be knowledgeable on that academic level. You have to be working in real time and helping a person, you know, navigate uh, a new lifestyle and, you know, what they need to do. So every person is uniquely different. If Brian's going to be different than me and he's different than the people that he knows, but yet we follow a common path. And so in one way it's easy, another way it's a bit mysterious. So, hey, Brian, so tell me about your week. What, what have you discovered yourself? What are some fun things you liked and, uh, and some things that you have questions on? Um, uh, the first couple of days were definitely a little rough. I feel like what made this particular week super hard for me was I didn't have the time to really prepare for myself. So I went the route of doing as little cooking as possible. So what I ate wasn't very interesting per se, but that was fine. Um, but what I did notice was that it's really important to make sure that you're actually eating enough. And I'm pretty sure I, I touched on this the last time that we had spoke, but sometimes my day is so busy that sometimes I just forget that I should be eating something. And now that the diet's starting to switch over, I've been noticing some changes about myself. One of the first ones was uh, regarding sleep. I told you that I would sleep, I would wake up maybe once, maybe twice a night every night. Now I feel myself getting physically more tired later into the day to the point where I need to I force myself to go to sleep because I just can't go on anymore. But when I do get to bed, um, I've noticed the last few nights that I actually stay asleep the entire night, which is incredible. And when I wake up, I actually do feel physically rested, um, which is really interesting to me because I feel like, quote unquote, I've changed nothing, you know, besides just my diet. Mm -hmm. Outside of that, um, one thing that I, I did notice, too, is that um, when I started using the ketone strips in, in the beginning, I was a little confused because... You know, I'm supposed to be monitoring with the, these reagent strips, but, you know, the increments in which, uh, in which the shades go up are actually pretty high. So being that I've been maxing out the, uh, the strip in purple um, for the last few days now, I'm, I'm wondering if I was kind of like at a loss for, for using the strips anymore, like if I should just immediately switch over to actually monitoring the other way. Yeah. Um, but outside of that, um, I mean, I, I don't have cravings for sugar anymore, um, which is pretty cool. I don't think about snacking. I actually don't have any desire to snack, which is interesting because I figured, like me, uh, I would here or there, even if I just saw something, even if I wasn't hungry, I'd go to grab it, but you know, it's not really there anymore. But besides that, I mean, that's really like where I'm at. I, I do feel like I have physically more energy, at least mental energy in the office. But when I did go to the gym, I did notice that I did feel a, a little bit more fatigued and a little bit harder in that fatigue while I was training. But I, I feel like that has probably something to do with the way that my body, my body's trying to get its energy right now. I agree. Let me comment on some of those things. Uh, I'll work backwards from the most recent. So yeah, and working out, you are in a period of adaptation um, and call it acute adaptation that you always be adapting up to, you know, the researchers, people are still adapting, professional athletes are still adapting endurance athletes like football players and soccer players and so on and so forth are still adapting after two years. So it's a process and you're going to see numbers change for you. But initially, obviously, it's a big change and uh, it has to do with starting to make ketones. And now you have this alternative fuel flowing through your blood. Your body's beginning to learn this ancestral reminder like, I remember you about 14,000 generations ago, more or less, uh, or when you're, you're when we're all born in ketosis, but we soon snap out of it. So that's kind of what's happening. And your body's getting to be a little more efficient with uh, this new kid on the block. And I, I say that somewhat facetious, facetiously. And let's take your urine strips. So 
I, I know we've talked a little bit before, but so your urine strips are measuring ketones that have been excreted from the body. Obviously, that's why they're a urine strip. But what mm. that number means is that it's not ketones in your blood, it's ketones in your urine. So the good news is your body has has woken up, in essence, and has been able to produce ketones. It didn't need a, a major uh, kick in the head to get it going. And so now your kidneys are saying, huh, ketones, I swear I've never seen this before. What do I do with it? So it has to go through a phase of adapting and saying, oh, ketones are good. No, let's not filter those out. Let's let's keep those in. And so you're going to see if you had, since you brought up, you know, do I track by urine strip or do I track by uh, blood? Depends how academic you want to get. The usefulness of urine strips will deteriorate. It will become less and less useful because your kidneys are going to get smarter and smarter. They're going to get more and more refined by saying, oh, we're not supposed to be letting these ketones out. Spill is the word. Just like you, a diabetic would spill sugar, you'd be spilling ketones in your urine. Okay. It realizes, mm. no, let's not do that. So it tends to learn how not to filter out your uh, ketones. So that's what happens to the urine strip. Some people, it happens in 30 days, others in three or four months. What I mean is these people who are using their urine strip, it's primarily, is it, you know, red, pink, or is it dark purple? I, am I spilling ketones or am I not spilling ketones? They see that, and it is potentially good news. It is, I'm making ketones, correct. It's a positive reinforcement that they're making ketones, but it shows that they're spilling it and their, their uh, kidneys are a little slower, if they take three months and four months, a little slower to, you know, respond and decide to, you know, keep the ketones. So that's what that's about. So the blood part... Okay is kind of just the opposite. So you're, let's say you're making 10 uh, ketones, beta-hydroxybutyrate is what we're talking about. It's actually 10 ketone bodies, BHB, okay. we're gonna call it. And so you're making 10 units of BHB. And initially, they're all just flowing right out with the urine. So you're not so much feeling a benefit, but as that release gets made less, you're gonna see the numbers start to rise uh, in your blood. So that will happen soon enough. So you can do, depends, as I say, it depends how academic you wanna get, uh, eventually, we're just going to be looking at blood. And uh, don't stop taking your glucose. The story is actually more about glucose becoming normal over time and your body depending less on glucose. And ketone bodies are the new kid on the block, but both are very important numbers to track once you start tracking them. One question that I have regarding blood sugar is... I've been averaging, typically I'll, I'll be under 80, and uh, it looks like whenever I check it, it's usually like around or just under 80. I mean, that's relatively normal from what it seems that I've been, you know, from what I've been looking at online. Am I going to see my blood sugar actually drop more? Those are good numbers, by the way. Um, yeah. So so I would say that it's questionable. Everybody's different. What that means to me now, you have insulin sensitivity. That's the, the obvious answer. But where, why does one person have a better insulin sensitivity than another? And it usually comes to their athletic past. You know, they mm. were always on a team. They're always very active. Um, and it became a formalized part of their personality at some point. And so they might in their late teens, early adulthood, have a sedentary job, but it's that can be quickly altered because they they have a foundation that's uh, insulin sensitive. So that's what that speaks to. So will it go down? Mm -hmm. Maybe. You know, we're kind of on new territory collectively as a population, but most mm -hmm. people that I have worked with, it's really about getting them under 100 comfortably on a daily basis, getting them from the 90s into the 80s, and ideally to your numbers into the high 70s or low 80s as a normal number. And you're already at that normal number, so uh, we'll see where that goes. I, I can't imagine it's gonna go a lot lower, but the world of, and when I say insulin sensitivity, it means you just need a drop of insulin to you know, guide your blood sugar, it detects the blood sugar, to mm -hmm. get stashed away into fat cells or the muscle and so on. And so you need to use so little insulin that you're already pretty acutely attuned. Will it kind of be more refined? Maybe. But other people, their insulin is almost deaf, and that's called insulin resistance. In other words, they put out a ton, and they really can't change their blood sugar as much, and that is way off to you know, type two diabetes, but that's the range. Wow, that's uh, that's actually super interesting. So, so I can better understand that. So, essentially, what you're saying is that because 
I because I happen to have that particular past that it only takes a little bit of sugar for me to actually store that energy for it to become fat, right? That means that I'm more or less predisposed to gain weight if I'm sedentary for any period of time. That's an interesting way of saying that. Um, I'd have to sort of say that's probably true. I hadn't quite reversed engineered it that way. But uh, whether you're more predisposed, uh, I would say that's probably correct. And I'll give you an example to show that is that the highest rates of type 2 diabetes, which is acquired diabetes, not ones that you're born with, so it's all about insulin mm -hmm. resistance, has to do mm -hmm. with uh, Polynesians and uh, Native Americans. And so uh, in North America, there's this tribe called the uh, Puma Indians, just like the shoe, Puma. And it's interesting because the border of the United States passes through the territory of the ancestral lands of the Puma Indians. So in the United States, uh, the native, we can call them the Native Americans or Indians, what we call them, but of the Puma Indians, that, you know, all the f high carb foods and all the trashy foods were available, whereas the other side of this particular part of Mexico was generally pretty poor. And so their diet didn't change much. You know, they were mm. poor. And so what happened is the North American part had high, it's the highest part of diabetes in North America, whereas the mm. same people that didn't change their diet. Uh, in Mexico did not have diabetes. You also can say uh, in Polynesia, I think the highest rates is in the Samoans. And so what, what, what's the shakeout? You could say that these uh, tribes, these collection of uh, ethnic genes were the least to get into this modern diet of high carbs and sugar. And when that came in, Hawaiians also can be, you know, we now see Hawaiians as heavy, but they weren't heavy prior to uh, 1740s, I believe, when Cook arrived. And so they were thin, you know, but now suddenly you had all those carbs brought in. And so they were acutely sensitive and their body was saying, store, you know, if you get a little extra calories in the day, store that sucker because extra yeah. calories never happened in their life. So now they come into <laughs> a vault of all these extra calories. And, and and so what you sensed about yourself is exactly true with the Samoans, the Hawaiians, the Puma Indians, and you can go on and on and on. I mean, that would make sense uh, if you're if you're making that kind of comparison. I'm actually a first generation American. Um, my family is actually from the Dominican Republic. And in the Dominican Republic, you know, when you grow up, you're more I mean, it's a third world country. You're not really you're not really getting a lot of extra calories, so to speak. What other qualifier to put on what they picked up when they came to the United States and all the other stories to tell you? It's a thing called uh, it's a category of additives. Uh, hardly call it food. It's called obestogens. And so those are used to be called xenoestrogens, but they're in the same category. And so you now have another chemical reason, not just a calorie reason that uh, people generally uh, perhaps women more so, but I don't know that off the top of my head are getting fatter faster. Really quick, uh, I just wanted to go over the few metrics that I did actually have. Unfortunately, yesterday, I was unable to actually record anything, unfortunately, outside of what I actually ate. Um, so we're kind of at a loss for the 17th. However, what it looks like to me is uh, regarding my weight, I actually have lost nine pounds. Um, and it looks like my body fat has gone down one point. 1.7%, so nearly 2% Excellent. Um, since I started, which is pretty interesting. Um, the one measurement that I'm not trying to take every day is my waist size, because pretty soon I'm going to want to stop paying attention to how much weight I'm quote unquote losing since I'm going to be in the gym. One thing that I did notice regarding muscle mass is that my, my muscle mass has actually gone up since I started measuring. Interesting. In part, you know, I've seen that too, and I can't quite explain muscle mass going up without any, you know, external application and so on. And even if you were working out, you wouldn't see it change. As you know, you wouldn't see it change that quickly. Um, mm -hmm. So I sort of take it as uh, part of the adaptation adaptation phase, and it certainly is better than muscle mass going down. But I I tend not to discount a lot of initial data other than weight uh, loss. 
because it's your body is going through a big change and then we start to see, see things level out in week three, four, five. And, you know, obviously by the end of two months, you're, you got a steady state of a sort. But in terms of weight, to give you a, 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 a thumbs up and also to give you a little background on that is that people do generally have uh, a pretty easy weight loss initially. And uh, it's great, just like seeing the ketones in the urine. It's a great sort of uh, positive reinforcement. But it's a, a little on the artificial side. And what I mean is, you know, we've, we've talked about one key thing we'll get into a little more is that we're, we're stopping carbohydrates. And, and so carbohydrates is a word of carbon plus water. Mm-hmm. And so you've now no longer eating these water-filled calories. We're going to call them that yeah. way. So consequently, okay. you're, you've lost that water. So the water, it's water weight a lot that is being lost initially is the point. Mm-hmm. It will go down. It will probably plateau for a while. It might even uh, climb a little bit and then it will go back again. So uh, it, it's interesting how it's not a straight line. Okay. Anything else that you've thought about? Oh, yes. This is actually really interesting. I'm starting to feel more level. I start, my brain is starting to feel like more at like a, a hum where it's like now the tasks that I'm thinking about aren't just racing through my head. I'm starting to actually hone in and slow down. It's almost like I'm slowing my thinking down a little bit. And I'm not sure if it has anything to do with uh, the adaptation or if this is what, you know, um, the changes regarding mental focus are supposed to be like, or if I'm even supposed to be feeling them this soon. But I mean, hey, it works for me. I think I think you are, and I think that uh, you're now 28 years old, and so by most measurements, you're a young kid, and so therefore changes will happen with you a lot faster than somebody who's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years older than you. Mm-hmm. Kind of goes without saying, and people younger than you will be even faster. But you know, there's been a number of uh, I hate to say studies because it makes it such an academic reference, but there's mm-hmm. a, a number of over enough data about epilepsy and about early diabetic diets, which is basically a ketogenic diet. And so especially with epilepsy, one of the first things that they notice with with kids that go on the ketogenic diet is that, you know, their whole life has been pretty frantic. You know, they go through these seizures and they pass out and some of them pass out a couple times a day. And so it's hard to have a life around that. And so when they go on the ketogenic diet is that they find that there's a calmness that comes over these kids. There's a intellectual focus, a mental focus, intellectual focus that is objectively noticed across the board of from all different populations of these kids. They were the first to en masse take on a ketogenic diet since the 20s. So, and it's all been, also been known with uh, kids, and I guess you can say adults, but mostly with kids uh, that are ADHD, you know, uh, very hyperactive kids that are generally medicated in this culture anyway, that they've actually calmed down. So that switch of going to ketone bodies from glucose as a primary, or at least as a equal, a fuel to mitochondria and to you know brain power, which is really mitochondria in the brain, that uh, it's significant, you know, and then it speaks to, so we're talking neurological and you know, and from there you go, oh, that's amazing for the average person that wasn't necessarily looking for these things. And now you go, well, look at all these other related issues that are even more compounded to the betterment of the condition. So multiple sclerosis, ALS, mm. uh, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. So it's really the same effect in a different category of people that have a, a more serious condition, but it's the same, same. It's very impressive. Yeah. So I did actually have One day where I ended up consuming more than 20 grams of carbs. I know that I haven't, I haven't been averaging 20 through this week, but, um, when you have, you know, mistakes like, you know, like the one that I actually had, um, how concerned should I be regarding it derailing me through this process? Uh, really not at all. Uh, from what I know of you and the fact that you work in something what I consider pretty technical, you know, you're drilling down to the minutia, unlike most people. So mm-hmm. what your self-observation is so small that no, even if you took a day off, so it's, you're actually bringing up a much bigger point. It's a dynamic thing we're after. It goes left, it goes right. And we're, we're trying to pull in this whole homeostasis thing into working primarily on ketones. And we want the the benefits of all that. And so, yeah, mm-hmm. you, even if you totally blew it a day and went out and had beers, which I'm not encouraging you to do, it mm-hmm. you didn't ruin it. You didn't, it's not like homework. You know, you were in the, you were in the uh, AP class and you had one bad day, you didn't do your homework. They're not going to boot you out. This is not that yeah. at all. 
Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, you, you just mentioned something, uh, beer. Are there any options for somebody who is choosing a keto diet if they do choose to drink? That's a great topic. I mean, it's, I wouldn't call it a struggle, but uh, it's a little knowledge and a little self-discipline and a little, oh, well, you'll take the consequences kind of thing. So what mm-hmm. I mean is lining up all alcohols from spirits. So spirits are things like vodka and tequila and, you know, your whiskey and your bourbons and uh, all that. That's your spirits to your wines, to your beers. Cordials actually would be even worse, but your beer is your worst defender because it has the most carbs in it as a drink. So it was hard for me. I used to make my own beer, a fair amount of it. I spent a lot of time in the Northwest and there's a lot of microbrews and you could live life just on microbrews and it's all very fascinating. I think it's fascinating. Knowing what the consequences are is half of one's actions, right? Once you're aware, then it puts it in a different era. I found personally then in having beer, it did pull me out and I felt an odd sense that beer wasn't as much fun as it used to be for me to have. So it's no longer a discipline for me to avoid beer. And uh, I do have alcohol, not on a regular basis. There is a category of wine that there's this guy, I met him, it's Todd White. He started a company called Dry Farms Wine. I might have him interviewed on the show later. And what he did, he really... You know, he really appreciated being keto. He discovered about four years ago and his whole life became keto. And he also, he lives in Napa Valley. And he goes, huh, this this wine isn't working out for me. Uh, How can I make it work? So what he did is that he realized he looked for wines that were completely fermented. So they're mostly European wines. And so most American wines, you know, so it's a very ultra dry wines for the most part. And uh, their alcohol percent is generally as an average around 12%. So uh, the thing is, most wines, you know, the sweet wines are not 100% fermented. That's why they're sweet. You can taste the sugar in it. But the dry wines, extreme, you know, complete fermentation, there should be no sugar there. And so the dry farm wines is selected from around the world. And it's pretty interesting. His whole, this is a business model he made for himself. And actually it's working big time is that it doesn't affect your your blood glucose or your ketones. And that was, I've tested that and I go, that's amazing. So then, then you're into spirits and spirits don't, so all alcohol, so all alcohol, spirits, uh, the dry farm wines, just the alcohol portion of beer. It, if you just had that little equivalent of alcohol, call it an you know, uh, Everclear equivalent you know, of alcohol, mm-hmm. um, that what it does while you're having that, it actually doesn't take you out of ketosis it stops your ketosis and it prefers to burn the alcohol first as a source of energy. So it's almost like a fourth type of energy, but you will feel that mm. first. It will burn, it will be a priority fuel. And once that's done, you'll go back into where you left off, kind of like a uh, recording that you stopped. Huh. So that's how long. Interesting. Yeah. Does that mean that you would probably be more, more so affected by the alcohol? Uh, they say yes, because for probably a number of reasons, but primarily on keto, you, you, you have less and less of a desire, and especially for those who are beer drinking, that whole uh, carb aspect. And so the less you have, the more sensitive you are to having it. And uh, I, I think the answer is yes, but to, to be determined on a per person basis. So now that, uh, I mean, right now I'm presently in day six of the first week of doing this. And right now, the only thing that I am counting is 20 uh, grams of carbs per day. Great. Um, and I'm kind of doing whatever I want, more or less, uh, regarding protein and fat. Great. Is there anything that I should be looking to be more aware about in this next upcoming week? Um, let me ask you a few questions before I pop that in. Everything's sort of on mm-hmm. a on a per path basis. And so for you, tell me what foods you're having. So if I was to follow you around and, you know, what did you eat for the course of the day? I saw, I mean, it, I, I want to parenthetically mentioned that you included me as a shared participant on your uh, uh, chronometer so I get to see what you're eating and when I saw it a couple of days ago I go this guy's starving himself to death he had, <laughs> and I go and so when I talked to you before and I was concerned I'm like no no it's not a calorie restricted diet it's we're just changing a category here you said no that wasn't about that it was just you didn't feel uh, impelled to eat because you're doing other things and I thought I think that's fine if you so Following your gut instinct is really what this is about. We're not superimposing much discipline. It is take some discipline to only eat within twenty carbs per day. But tell me, what where you where all this is where are the calories coming from? What foods are you eating? Well, I'd say I'd say easily I was the most proud of yesterday more so than anything else. Um, I actually made 
Uh, I made some shrimp with uh, some eggs and bacon with uh, some cauliflower rice. That was probably the most complete type of food that I've had. Other days, it's usually like things that I'm trying to, that I usually end up getting when I don't have time. Like for example, um, I've been doing a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, chicken breast and spinach because uh, I'm trying to make sure that I get some sort of fiber. I had a broccoli slaw the other day. It was literally just cut up broccoli, broccoli with a little bit of cut up uh, carrots, which was a little bit higher in carbs than I wanted it to be for um, what it was. Um, I, I was eating more avocado in the beginning of the week, but I didn't, I didn't realize that that could be very easily overdone regarding my allotment for 20 carbs for the day. Mm. It's looking like mostly chicken, eggs, bacon, sausage, and shrimp in that order regarding proteins. I had tuna one day, and then regarding fats, it's mostly cheeses and, and butter. I only made the, the mayonnaise yesterday, but I haven't had any on any food yet. You made mayonnaise. Tell me about that. You had actually given me a recipe for a, a mayonnaise that uses the uh, MCT oil. So I went in ahead and uh, I made some of that, but I actually haven't tried any of it yet. Um, so I'm definitely looking forward to it. I did actually get an opportunity to pour some of the MCT oil over my protein. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's I can't explain it, but I completely agree with you. It, somehow it makes the food taste better. I, well, good. I'm impressed. You know, week one, you are a fast student. You said that before. Also, you like uh, your... You have some culinary expertise, which most people do not have, and it's usually an effort for them to open that door. So, you know, your results, I can't argue with your results. You, you know, you're making ketones. We see that in urine. So that's like the only thing I wanted you to see happen. That happened. You've dropped your carbs. See, when we say low-carb, high-fat diet, is that mm -hmm. we're shutting off the glucose for the most part. Not completely. That's an impossibility, by the way. But we're also okay. deciding to supply... Uh, the precursor, if you will, fat for ketones. And I it's an advanced topic, but we'll get into it later, kinds of fats and their efficiency to create ketones and, you know, some things you might want to change up. But yeah, you're a fast study. Uh, your cooking is very good. You've already made your mayo. I would say the only trick, and I hesitate to even say this as a trick, and I hesitate to say this to you because you're already getting results that I would thought would have come in uh, week three or later, and you're having your chicken, your spinach, uh, and these are good qualitative, qualitative food choices to make. And um, the only thing I would say is that you add in your fat, you're already doing that. You either pour it on, that's why I make the mayo, I, I use it exactly what you're doing. You know, it's, what's my quick addition for fat? You can even add some into your, uh, the coleslaw, if that's part of, you know, what you have. So once you have that category of fat that is not a struggle to figure out, you know, and you're not stuck like, oh, I made this meal, now i got to add fat, or, oh, it wasn't fatty enough, um, you pretty much have the variables, you know, pretty flexible. So I would say keep doing that. I, I like your, you can open up the veggie choices if you want to, if you feel constrained. Don't, you know, don't feel constrained, but these are great choices. The cauliflower, the spinach. I, I feel like cauliflower and spinach were the easiest because for me personally, I, I actually do happen to like them a lot. And um, they, they kind of fall more or less in line with what I'm doing with this particular diet. But I want to make a point of trying to have uh, introduce some sort of vegetable or green every time that I eat. Mm -hmm. Just because for me, just for digestion, I feel like overall it'll just be better for me. Yep. So if you have any recommend recommendations for me outside of the spinach, the, the broccoli, and the cauliflower, I'm, I'm all ears. Well, right now we're kind of in our uh, zero carb month, but basically the routine, and people do follow into a routine, you know, because they don't have time to be creative every day. And so what's their, and it was the same thing working in the clinic. If you can sort of, you know, help them with their routine and have that be easy, then all their exceptional nights can be fun and fancy when they have time to do that. So uh, the routine that we had was, in, and we had a garden, we lo love vegetable gardens and so on. We'd have usually a nice salad and we'd throw in, we've, we've tested everything now and you go, yeah, tomatoes are higher sugar or not. But, you know, in the summer you make those exceptions. But uh, I was surprised that things like that actually did make an exception. And I wouldn't be too worried if you had some, and even onions are pretty sugary, uh, fresh onions. But I would the general mode was having a salad because that was easy to throw together. The broccoli, the cauliflower, uh, and the spinach were pretty much, sometimes you'd have uh, stir fry, you know, kale or stir fry. Oh, I can't think of it right now, but it's, it's along the same idea. That would be sort of the fallback veggies. What I've learned, at least in my 
learning curve here is a lot of people think, oh, I have to have my veggies for my fiber. I think, and I'm not the first to think this, by the way, uh, I should say I've heard at various conferences from people I respect, how's that, that mm. the consideration of fiber is going to be come into a, a reevaluation. So uh, when I was early years of practice, uh, 1999, 2001, 2003, and 2004, I was reading all about fiber. You know, fiber was like the definitive difference between one's blood sugar, a diabetic and non-diabetic. You know, one had Mm. processed foods versus whole foods, meaning what you're having. So that was that was true to an extent, but unfortunately, that kind of observation came from a category of people that probably had high carbs and low fat, and so it's sort of being tossed out by those who are at the cutting edge of all this, and it's going to have to come into a reevaluation. So I would do exactly what you're doing. Those are the choices right now, and you know you're within your 20 grams, and that's that is awesome. I would say keep on doing that. We got two months to go. I'm just going to let you burn another week at status quo before we, you know, amp it up. And there isn't a lot more amping up. It's just going to get more refined. You know, if you can sustain these two weeks like you've done, then that's what I, you know, before I put on another little weight on your stack of weights, I want to make sure you're good at what you're lifting right now, so to say. And obviously it appears like you are. Then we'll talk in and we'll calculate your your protein um, ballpark, you know, what you need in a, in a on a daily basis, so you're not mm. overeating and you're not undereating, and that will be adjusted over time. And then later on, you know, the rest is always going to be fat. Some it's fat's not something you usually calculate unless we think we're having too much, but mm. um, it's usually the fat story usually comes down to knowing your fats, what fats you're using, and why you're using them, and uh, that's a different category. And that's pretty much like the whole ball of wax. You already have, you already like cooking things, and that's. Eighty percent of what most people's lives are problematic about. They don't like to cook, haven't learned to cook, and so the choices in their lives are very hard to make. They're saying, well, "What process?" In essence, they're saying, "What processed foods can I buy?" Because my life is what in a rush or whatever they want to justify, and that's a harder place to be. So you're not in a hard place. The one thing that I would say that we discovered since you're asking about culinary tips is that. Mm-hmm. One of the fast things we do, and if you do a little baking, it's, it is with uh, broccoli. And so actually, uh, Brussels sprouts is another one. We do this with both mm. broccoli and but Brussels sprouts. We do baked okay. Brussels sprouts, but on, and we put a lot of spices on it. So it's on a baking pan. And we, we do it with uh, rosemary and garlic. So rosemary, mm. you know, s- sprinkled throughout this on this pan. Garlic, you know, placed throughout on this pan. We put in olive oil, you know, so they're all been... I won't say they've been marinated, but they've all been completely covered in uh, olive oil. It mm-hmm. gets baked at, um, I believe it's 250, but I can check with, uh, it's just so, so rote, don't even think about it anymore. Uh, mm-hmm. And then we take it out after about 10 or 15 minutes, you uh, stir it around a little bit on the pan and you cook it again. The aromatic quality that, it, that your kitchen then is exposed to is just phenomenal. And mm-hmm. uh, so you're still in the same family. So your broccoli or your, uh, your cauliflower, your Brussels sprouts, um, are all the same family, the cruciferous. And so it's really interesting that they're your fallback and it's a good source to fall back to. I do my best to spend as little time as possible cooking. So, I mean, if I can put something in the oven, let it hang out for a little, and then actually, you know, only work with it a little bit in a pan. Hey, that's great. That's less work for me, more or less. Good. I'll send, Um, I'll send you the specifics on that as well. I just want to, uh, Review so I'll, I mean I'll check in on your uh, your shared chronometer readings. Yeah, I now that I'm not worried about you starving yourself for this and you're just simply playing it by ear. That's fine. You'll find out by the way as you get to be more ketogenic that uh, you're going to feel somewhat ancestral in the sense that you know it was feast or famine in the sense that people ate and then they didn't. You know if you want to picture the hunter gatherer, they were on a trip and they might not have eaten for a couple of days and so their body developed to how do I get by and not eating and obviously creating ketone bodies is it. So the reason I say this, you're going to find that you actually will go long periods of time without thinking of food and saying, what just happened here? And if you're flying to some far off country, um, you know, that takes a day and a half to get there, whatever, you're going to find that as long as you're hydrated enough, you don't necessarily have to eat all the junk food that's presented in front of you because you're good. So that's, Mm. that's, 
that's a big latitude, but I wouldn't have that be an exercise of discipline. I just play it by year and you, you, you're zeroing in your 20 grams a day of carbs. That's a big deal. And, um, I'll check in. Other than that, I just want to give you another week of, you know, having, oh, because this is your lifestyle. This is going, this is a lifestyle we're shooting for. It's not a uh, flash in the pan kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then next week we'll, we'll get a little more technical, another calculation and uh, see where we go from there. I think great work. You know, I, I really appreciate you jumping in with both feet. I was a little bit, a little worried when people get fast results because those are the people that burn out quickly. You know, they, uh, they're hyper vigilant. One thing you may want to add in, I know you have, uh, or you're planning to get a, uh, ketone meter or a, uh, uh, blood, uh, a glucose meter that if you mm -hmm. have those available, uh, take a few readings periodically, you know, together, you don't, don't, don't waste your time or money, but say, Hey, I started taking some of this. And if you can do them in tandem, no, it's repaired. It's a more valuable uh, reading to have, you know, it was after dinner, it was after working out and just have a, a little ref reference to what the context was for that reading. I'll put, I'll put some notes in here. You'll see sometimes I'll actually, I actually will put some notes on depending on what it is, just cause I thought something was interesting or I made an observation. Good, 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 good. Uh, another little fun thing is, uh, relative to your category of sleep, you know, your quality of sleep. Um, put down dreams. If you have dreams, I don't mean write the dreams out, but did you dream? Did you wake up and go, well, that was quite a movie. Uh, or did you go, uh, I don't know what happened, but I'm here in the morning rested and that's fine. Uh, but dreams super. Okay. So if there's no more questions, let's bring it to an end. I think we've had a good session here. You're doing great. Uh, from my perspective, you're an easy convert. It does not work this way with a lot of people. You know, some are very eager. Some are, uh, are stuck in a particular lifestyle. Also your age, I keep on saying that, I don't mean to, but uh, mm -hmm. it implies a certain flexibility to lifestyle. For, that, that's cool. I, I really appreciate you uh, you saying that. I mean, you know, I definitely am trying, you know, I'm trying to be conscientious, but you know, it's a, it was difficult for the first several days, but then it quickly became easier than I thought. I think for, for, for me getting over the whole concept of like not being able to snack or not having access to sugary drinks, stuff like that, kind of a, a mild bummer, so to speak. But I mean, like it goes away pretty quick. I mean, you know, especially if you have a lot of stuff to do during your day. Now I just don't even really think about food so much. Now it's like, you know, I'll go into the chronometer and I'll be like, oh, wow, I probably should eat a lot more because I haven't done too much today. You know? Yep. So that's that's now that's now my line of thinking. Yeah, that's definitely when I think about it, what is your total weight loss goal? My total weight loss goal. OK, so uh, I know that I know that I should be able to get somewhere roughly uh, somewhere roughly around 150 some odd pounds. But if I can get in the neighborhood of like the 160s, that'd be pretty incredible. I mean, I'm only uh, I'm height wise, I'm only five foot five. And I know that I mean, back in my senior year of high school, I was wrestling at 140 and 145 pounds. I know that since then I've grown into myself a lot more. Mm. I know that I'm physically bigger than I was, you know, as an 18 year old. So I don't think that I don't think it would be realistic to think, oh, yeah, 140, 145. But if I can get into the 160s, that'd be pretty cool. But I feel like that's going to be a bigger a bigger task than the 60 days that I have here. And your starting weight was, a, was it 124? Do I remember that correctly or no? Oh, no. My starting weight was 209.4 uh, yeah. pounds. Okay. Okay. So in your, in your wish list, you have another 40 pounds anyways to lose uh, in your... And we'll see where we go. All right, that's that's fair enough. And what was your percent body fat? In the beginning, it was thirty five point nine percent, and right now it's thirty four point two. Wow. Okay. Do you remember your BMI? Um, and that's actually not a metric that was that's that's defaulted mm -hmm. in chronometer. So mm -hmm. I think I'm just gonna start adding it. But uh, today my BMI was. Uh, 31.5. You know, these numbers have, have meanings and these percentages have meanings. So when you're over 30% body fat and when you're over 30 for BMI, uh, you're considered obese. So there, this is a big deal. So your whole talk about weight loss is, is not so much a wish, wish list. It's uh, a real objective to get to. Uh, so ideally, our goal on BMI would be 25 or less, you know, 24, maybe 23, but 25 or less is fine. Uh, your weight, 
you know, you know, for a guy, you, you can drop down to 20 easily uh, over time. And mm. depending how chiseled you want to get after that, it's a personal choice. But so this is going to be remarkable. I, I think you're going to have in 60 days a lot more change than you anticipated. Okay, let's wrap it up and we'll put it into this uh, episode. And it's it's been a great talking to you, Brian. It's, uh, you're such a spirit to continue with all this. It's impressive. Thank you so much for uh, for letting me actually go and uh, go ahead and do this with you. Uh, it's uh, it's been a pretty awesome opportunity. I've been enjoying it so far. <laughs> okay, take care. Bye bye. Thanks for listening. For anybody who has any questions, feel free to contact me on our Facebook group, Keto Naturopath. Same name as our podcast. I'm open to any questions, and we plod through the good and the bad, the difficult and the easy, week after week.